You ready to get on with our story here? So Jesus has died. He's breathed his last, said it's finished. The thunder has cracked. The earth has quaked. The rocks have split. The veil has torn. And Jesus is dead on the cross. And we start in verse 57 of Matthew 27. And here's, let's follow along. When it was evening, there came a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph, who himself also became a disciple. This man went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Then Pilate ordered it to be given to him. And Joseph took the body and wrapped it in a clean linen cloth and laid it in his own new tomb, which he had hewn out in the rock. And he rolled a large stone against the entrance of the tomb and went away. And Mary Magdalene was there and the other Mary sitting opposite the grave. Now on the next day, the day after the preparation, which preparation for the Sabbath, the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered together with Pilate and said, Sir, we remember that when he was still alive, that deceiver said, After three days I am to rise again. Therefore give orders for the grave to be made secure until the third day. Otherwise, his disciples may come and steal him away and say to the people, he has risen from the dead, and the last deception will be worse than the first. Pilate said to them, you have a guard. Go make it as secure as you know how. And they went and made the grave secure, and along with the guard, they set a seal on the stone. Now, there's more to the story of them guarding the grave and all that, but what they really did was they made it almost impossible to fake it. So when Jesus came out of the grave, they had to make up all kinds of stories about they fell asleep, which is punishable by death, by the way. But they had to make up all kinds of stories. But the fact is that they made it so that only a miracle could have Jesus back up walking around Jerusalem. Now, over the centuries, there's been the swoon theory that Jesus only swooned on the cross and that he revived later. But This story says that the centurion, the very man made responsible to crucify and and punish criminals, and he was a pro at it, he declared him dead. This guy knows death. We've already talked about the centurion and what his role in life has been, how he became a garrison centurion. means he has fought many battles. He has proven himself many times. To be able to come to a peace, not not in a front line, but a rear guard position. And he knows death when he sees it. And there's almost zero chance Jesus swooned and later was revived and, and woke up from the dead. And there's very little chance he got out of that tomb with that rock up against it and those guards out there. So these Pharisees almost made Easter morning the, the resurrection to be a miraculous and believable and 2,000 years lasting story that Jesus did come out of the grave. The other thing we just read before this was that relatives came out of the grave and visited their friends and family. And so this power over death being so powerful, these guys have basically proven that their stories aren't true because they were guarding it with a very strong guard and Jesus came out of the grave. So that part of the story is kind of exciting that they were trying to prove he wasn't risen, but what they did was made it very believable that this was a truly supernatural thing that happened. Now, this Joseph of Arimathea, the the very beginning of this is so important. I want to try to tell a little bit about Joseph. He was a, we'll read three verses and it will reveal that he was a member of the Sanhedrin, a member of the ruling council. So he was a very powerful man. History tells us he was a very wealthy, it says he's wealthy, but that he was a wealthy tin merchant. And that in this, it says he was a believer. And what happened was that Joseph later, after this, after the Bible story ends, Philip became the leader in Jerusalem once Peter and all of them went off on missionary journeys. And Philip sent Joseph to England, the area known as England now. Britannia, I think it was called then. And Joseph, the legend says, and there's so many stories about Joseph going to England, 
It says, there's one story that says he went to Glastonbury, England, if you know where that is, and he took his staff and he jammed it in the ground and it grew into a thorn bush immediately. Uh, and, and as part of his preaching was the, you know, the, the gospel of Jesus Christ. And he, and he opened up Christianity in, in England and, and preached it. And the, the very beginnings of all Christianity in England started with Joseph of Arimathea. That's, that's historical legend. Can't really be proven except for the fact that he was in England and he did start Christianity in England. The staff and all of that is just stories that have come through life, through, through all the different historians and stuff. And so Joseph of Arimathea became a believer. And he went on to be a believer to the end of his days, evangelizing the areas he was sought. We're going to read the Great Commission of Jesus Christ, and Joseph of Arimathea is one of those people who were sent out to make disciples of every nation. And he went to what is modern-day England and preached the gospel and started an entire nation, a Christian nation, that to, to this day is still a powerful place and has great results of his journey. His fruit is amazing throughout history. Are you following me? Am I boring you with this historical stuff? You like that. All right. So Joseph comes forward, and it says that he goes to Pilate to ask for this body. And we tend to just read past that. Oh, he was a believer. Okay, some of them Pharisees were believers. No, he was like a hair on a biscuit. He was conspicuous. You go to eat your biscuits, got a hair. He was like one of those guys. Guy that when he walks in the room, he's a believer in that guy? He was part of a group that conspired to kill Jesus. Now, let's read these verses about him being part of this. Uh, Luke 23, 50 through 51. And a man named Joseph, who was a member of a council, a good and righteous man, he had not consented to their plans of act and action. A man from Arimathea, a city of the Jews, who was waiting for the kingdom of God. And then Mark 15, 42 through 46. When evening had already come, because it was the preparation day, that is the day before the Sabbath... Joseph of Arimathea came, a prominent member of the council, who himself was waiting for the kingdom of God. And he gathered up courage and went in before Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Pilate wondered if he was dead by this time, and summoning the centurion, he questioned him as to whether he was already dead. And ascertaining this from the centurion, he granted the body to Joseph. Joseph bought a linen cloth, took him down, wrapped him in the linen cloth, and laid him in a tomb which he had been hewn out in the rock, and he rolled a stone against the entrance of the tomb. You can see when you read all three, like I read one, then I read two, these three different gospels telling this story. Each one, a little bit more to the story about Joseph. The writer knew different things, and you compile it, and it's pretty amazing. Joseph was a Pharisee. Joseph was a rich man. The, his, the historians say he was a tin merchant. And the centurion had to go in and testify, which he needs to be pretty right when he does this, and make sure he says he's dead. The swoon theory that's been around forever, the centurion says it's not true. He didn't swoon. He was dead. And Joseph goes and asks Pilate for the body. Now, try to understand this. If Joseph goes steps forward to claim the body of a crucified criminal, he becomes known as one of those who fraternize with a criminal. It wasn't very good to be known to fraternize with criminals. It wasn't a good thing to be the family member of a criminal. And only family members could ask for the body in the Jewish tradition and in the Roman tradition is that nobody touches the body. It lays there and rots as a sign to all the people. You do not want to be a criminal. And so Joseph goes in to the guy whose philosophy is let him rot. But trying to appease the Jews, he gives in to the Jewish principle and grants Joseph the body. Joseph may have been a family member, and some historians say that he was the uncle of Mary, the mother of Jesus. And I don't think you can prove that, but that would make him a blood relative of Jesus, making his request something easily granted. 
in a time when it wasn't a healthy thing to do to be associated with a crucified criminal. And yet he was rich, and yet he was powerful, and yet he was well known. He couldn't hide in the crowd, but he went forward and did this, and I'll tell you why. Because he also had become a disciple of Jesus. He became a disciple of Jesus, and his behavior becomes hard to reconcile with tradition. His, he became a disciple of Jesus, and his own safety became something that wasn't number one anymore. Wow. Now his reputation gets to go to his family. And if he's married, which he must be to be in the Sanhedrin, he must probably be the father of at least one son. Could be many, could be many daughters, I don't know. But your family gains what you gain. So you go and become a, a suspected criminal, then your family has also watched. Wow. So he becomes a disciple of Jesus, and even his family goes down into second place over his calling of God to take care of this Jesus. He becomes a disciple of Jesus and everything changes. There are even stories that he took Jesus on journeys as a boy. Become a disciple of Christ. Witness the death of someone you love, someone you have become a disciple to, and everything changes. Protecting of your wealth, your power, your position, everything changes. The worrying about the safety of your loved ones, everything changes. What is this disciple that would make you do that? What is becoming a disciple mean? Well, this word disciple doesn't exist the way we use it in, in, in the Hebrew or the Greek. The word disciple is a very specific word. It's very easy to follow, but it doesn't mean what we call it. It has an element to it that is learner, someone who learns from. But the most common use of it is when they describe two children who look alike, that they are identical, called identical twins, disciple twins. It's a word used to describe the becoming identical. Now, all of us have been around identical twins. Amy's sister walked by me three times at the movie theater back before I really knew Amy very well, and I said hi to her, and she totally ignored me, and I went home, man, Amy was so rude to me at the theater. <laughs> and my wife goes, well, uh, I don't know, so I go to Amy and said, what, did you like the movie last night? Which, what'd you go see? Well, I wasn't at the theater last night. You saw my sister. <laughs> oh, so some strange man's talking to her, and she's running, and you know, that kind of changes the whole outcome there. But we all understand that we, it took me a while. I, I'm sorry to say this. I'm sorry to admit it, but it, it, three times I did it. And uh, three times I thought, Amy, what, why are you mad at me? But we all know other identical twins. took me a while before Lindsay and Ashley became discernible. And there's all kinds of identical twins. Uh, Ruth has granddaughters. I, to this day, have no idea who's who. And they could fool me. They could, they could come to work. If they worked for me, they could interchange. I wouldn't know who was at work and who wasn't. But it's, that's how identical it is. That's what disciple means. Wow. So therefore, if you choose to become a disciple, you have chosen to begin the process of becoming not a little like Jesus, but you've begun the process of becoming identical to Jesus. Right. You have literally begun the process of committing to what he said. Be holy as your heavenly Father is holy. Be righteous as he is righteous, and it even says this, be perfect as he is perfect. Right. I'm not perfect, but back on March 10th, 1975, I had a revelation. And the only thing I could tell you from that revelation is he's real. What does that mean for March 11th, 1975? Do I have to be perfect? Well, no, it would be nice. It'd be nice if it was boom or, you know, bewitched or the genie, you know, it'd be nice if it was something like that, but it just isn't. Amen. It's a day by day, line by line, grueling. move by move, grueling by grueling change. And sometimes we come face to face with ourselves and just hate ourselves. It's like, oh my gosh, I'm nothing like him. 
And when it says Joseph of Arimathea became a disciple, and then you see him go risk everything by claiming the body, and then you see him giving his own, this incredible act of giving his own tomb that he made for himself, he must have really believed that tomb's only going to be needed for three days, you know, I'll get it back. I mean, he must have really believed. He must have really believed. Right? And then he gives up his position, gives up his wealth, and goes to England to preach the gospel. And dies in England. To this day, he's known to have been there, that he went there. When you become a disciple, do you become perfectly twinned? No. You begin the journey of becoming Perfectly twin. Do you know that it says that he will not stop working on your perfection until the day you present before him, before his glorious throne? You are new creatures in Christ, and he will not stop working on you until the day you stand before him. When he has perfected you. Now, I believe that there's going to be a great perfecting at my death. There's going to be a great perfecting where I'm going to leap from the 50 yard line to the touchdown in the twinkling of an eye. But in my life, I'm supposed to go from yard zero to yard 50 or whatever. The thief on the cross probably didn't make it to the five, but he got translated to the finish line. You understand what I'm saying? This is the discipleship process of Jesus Christ, that we give our life to him. And what happened to me on March 10th, 1975, was I found out he was real. Just found out he was real. Now, the sad part of that story is I spent my whole life in church. Every single Sunday, I stared at a cross with Jesus on it. I saw his suffering. Every year, they made me go through this grueling stations of the cross. Every time I walked in a building, I got taught about the holiness of God's presence in God's house. I had to be reverent all the time in this place. I got taught of the reverence. I got taught of everything. But I did not know he was real. I knew nothing. My wife had the same experience I had. We got to adulthood knowing nothing. Of he loves me and he's real and he's with me and he sees me and he hears me. I remember how easy it was to lead young people from my church to Jesus. I say, I know you sat in that pew your whole life. I said this to her. I know you sat in that pew your whole life going, I just wish I could know. I don't know what's going on. I wish I could know. And I led her to pray a prayer in 1979. And she radically saved. He's real. What do we do now? I said, I know. That's what you're wondering. Huh? What do we do now? Well, we just start taking line upon line. We just start moving forward. And he teaches us. And we walk like a dumb ox. And he leads us like a horse with a bridle. And when he wants us to go this way, we go this way. If we fight it, he'll let us fight it. But if we just submit and surrender to being perfected and being changed, it's like, he's grow- like you're a baby growing up. He changes your diaper. He deals with your stuff. He forgives your sin. And as long as you're after him to be like him, you have to recognize that his calling is for you to be like him. The things you see me do, you will do. And greater things than I do will you do. Because you'll have the whole world. I have Jerusalem. I have Israel. You have the whole world. You will do great things because you'll lead whole nations. And Joseph of Arimathea went and... And quite frankly, England for many years was a Christian nation. Did greater things than Jesus because he wanted to be a disciple. Because it says right here, he also had become a disciple. And you and I have to decide, are we churchgoers? Are we just believers? Or are we disciples? Are we being made perfect as he is perfect? Righteous as he is righteous? Are we willing to put on the righteousness of Jesus Christ as a breastplate? Are we ready to put on the faith in Jesus Christ? Put it on. The helmet of salvation. Are we ready to carry the sword of the Spirit and divide truth from lie? And being perfected, line upon line, day in, day out, word upon word, being perfected. Never okay with failure in terms of sin. Never okay with not being enough, but always wanting to be more. Further up, farther in, further up farther in. Hey, man, I had a great day yesterday. I got up and I got in and I, let's just rest for a minute. No. Are we like Jesus yet? 
No, then let's go. I never ticked off a crowd more. I've ticked off crowds in my life. Let me just tell you. I have a gift of ticking off people. I mean, I just, I, I mean, uh, ask my wife. She's amening. I have a gift for it. And I remember this crowd, they, they got, they, I told the story of leading a young Catholic girl to Jesus on a run on Tabor Mountain in Portland. I was there to play basketball, and I was on this team, and we were running. I, jump, I come through the bushes. I jumped over this couple of kids. They were not doing good. And I turned around. The, the team ran on without me, and they wanted to know why I didn't finish the run. I turned around and led them to Jesus. They were so mad at me. You really think that they got anything out of that? You caught them in sin, you know? I said, I led them to Jesus. They prayed with me. They had a powerful experience right there on this mountain. They found out he was real, and they were wearing the same uniform my wife wore. They were wearing the same uniform I was supposed to wear and never did. They, I know this uniform. I know what they're going through. They don't know he's real. And I led them to Jesus, and these people got so mad at me when I said this one thing. They said, what are, you, what, are you holier than thou? Do you think you're holier than us? And I'm like, I don't understand why me leading them to Jesus affects you. But nonetheless, I want to be perfect. Oh, my gosh, they went crazy. What are you trying to be? Perfect. You'll never be perfect. That might be true on this earth, but don't you know that he's perfecting me? Amen. Are you saying he's going to fail? He's not going to fail unless I walk away from him. And then he will fail because he will not perfect me. But if I'm working to do what he said, and this one guy stands up and goes, brothers, 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 brothers. He quieted the team down and everybody around. You know, it does say in the Bible, be perfect as he is perfect. Be holy as he is holy. I went, yeah, what, I mean, yeah. You're a Christian college, a Christian basketball team. I didn't know what I was talking about. I didn't know what they were talking about. I've never made anyone more mad to say I wanted to be perfect. I hope you're not mad. I want to be perfect. Nothing's changed. That was 1978. That was the fall of 78. That's a long time ago, man. And I think, I'm sorry, you might think I'm a little slow because I haven't made it yet. That's 42 years ago. And I ain't made it. I ain't made it. See what I mean by it? Case in point. I ain't made it. I'm not perfect yet. But, oh, I've come so far. And my eyes are on the prize. That's what a disciple is. Some of you started out last week. Some of you started out last year. Some of you started out 10 years ago. There is no end while we breathe of our pursuit of His holiness, our pursuit of perfection, our pursuit of being, here's the bottom line, like Him, our pursuit of being like Jesus. Paul said we are being conformed into the image of God's Son. Some good stuff right there, Maynard. Being perfected. And I got to get on board with him. I got to be on his page. Whatever Jesus bandwagon is going, I got to go with it. Let me get on the Jesus bandwagon. Let me get in the Jesus boat. You want to call it whatever you want? I want to be in the Jesus freaks. I want to be what he wants me to be. And I want to intend to never sin again and be perfect. And I think I can do it. And I'll keep repenting till I do. And here's the other awesome thing. God looks at me as long as I'm doing that. He sees me as perfect. Because he sees me through the blood of Jesus. The minute I start to worry about make my wealth more important, like Joseph gave up his wealth. Joseph put his family in danger. Joseph did a lot of things that a disciple sometimes is called to do, and he did them. And I think that sometimes, back to my story last week about aiming for the, aiming for the uh, target, if we're just firing off arrows everywhere saying, sorry, I missed. We aren't being perfected. We aren't even trying. All it requires is that I know who he is. He's real. So why don't we just follow him? That's what he said to them. You got to come and follow me. Well, let me go bury my father. Let the dead bury the dead. You need, I'm telling you, buddy, you need to come follow me. You want to make it? Come follow me. Come follow me. Every day, day in, day out, line upon line, come follow me. 
First thought in the morning, last thought at night. I'm now 45 years and counting since March 10th, 1975. People in the crowd know me to have failed miserably, but you've never known me to quit. I have never backslid, never turned back. I have missed miserably, but I was always trying. I was always aiming. Oh, did I blow it. Just get back up and let's get going again, man. Come on, you want to go with me? Let's just go again. Let's just keep on going, man. Let's just keep on one foot in front of the other. What do we do now? What's up now, Lord? What's up now, Lord? Let's go. I'm with you. Here I am. I'm with you. He has always been with me. These 45 years, he has never failed me once. And all I did on March 10th was find out he was real. And then I said, uh, what do we do now? He said, follow me, boy. I said, yes, sir. And I said, my king and my God. I now understand the cross. I now understand the stations. I understand the kneeling, the honor. Everything I was taught as a kid now comes into play. I must honor you. I must respect your kingdom and your house. The only thing I found out was the building wasn't his house. I was. And then I didn't get to just do it when I entered the door. I had to do it when I woke up, when I was alive. And I've been alive a while. I have to honor him. I have to serve him. Come on with me. Let's go. I'm trying to gather a group of people, and I don't care if it's big or small, by few or by many, I want to gather a group of people and have all these 45 years been gathering people to go with me to the mountain of the Lord. Let's find out what's possible to them who believe, to them who decide I am his disciple and I will forever be. And he will perfect me. And when he sits on his glorious throne, he will complete the job of perfecting me because that's what I want from him. He says, delight in me and I'll grant you the desires of my heart. I delight in him and the desire of my heart is that he will perfect me. That he will make me like him. Anybody agree you, that's kind of what you want too? Yes, that's what I want. That's what I want. <laughs> People say, why do you do the lights, lights of hope? We have one answer. We love Jesus. We want it to look like something. That's it. Why do you work so hard? We love Jesus. We want it to look for, like some. Why do you give everything? We love Jesus. <laughs> we want it to look like something. Right. We love each other because we love Jesus because we want it to look like something. Let's pray. Oh, Lord, <laughs> heal our wrong thinking and teach us your ways. Would you just say that, Jesus, heal my wrong thinking? Would you say it again? And teach me your ways. I want to be like you. I love you, Jesus. And I want to be like you. Call me and I'll come. Send me, I will go. Tell me what you want me to do and I will endeavor to do it. Come on, don't, don't fade out on me. I give my life to you again today. Come on, loud and clear. I give my life to you again today. Use me. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Who is perfect and holy and who I want to be. You are my hero, Jesus. Help me become your twin. I pray these things again by the name of the Lamb of God. Jesus, amen. Thanks for watching the Father's House Orville YouTube channel, but don't stop there. We'd love you to subscribe to our channel so that you never miss a live service or a video. Help us spread the message of Jesus by sharing this video with your friends 
You can also support the Father's House financially by clicking the Give button. Thanks again for watching today and we hope to see you again soon.